Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody to this uh, event that's jointly hosted by my program. I'm the director of the information program at the OS uh, Open Society Institute and by the Open Society Fellows uh, program. There are roughly three stories that <clears throat> have been told in the last few years about the effects of online media, social media, new media on uh, the public sphere, on democracy, on civic engagement. Uh, one is a kind of sunny, optimistic story. Um, one example, a recent example, would be uh, Don Tapscott, who's just published a new book on how young people engage online. And uh, he claims that uh, online media are making young people more collectively intelligent, more inclined to collaborate, more curious about the world than their uh, TV watching, passive couch potato predecessors. There's also a, a, another story that's told that's much more pessimistic, almost dystopian. Um, one example could be uh, the journalist Andrew Keane, who likes, who's written a book called The, the Cult of the Amateur, about how uh, the rise of uh, user-generated content is driving out expertise. It's, it's a, a kind of uh, occupation of the public sphere by the horde story, to, to caricature it. And then there are a third set of stories that are more nuanced. Um, I guess the most prominent example would be Cass Sunstein in his books uh, Infotopia and Republic.com has acknowledged that new media are probably an enhancement of democracy and, and the public sphere, but uh, they also bring new risks. In particular, the fragmentation of the public sphere into uh, enclaves of the like-minded um, and polarization of, of, of separate uh, echo chambers of people who, who um, egg, egg one another on to uh, more extreme views and have no interaction with, with uh, those of, of different perspectives. But all of these stories are based on the experience of developed open societies like the United States or Western Europe. And they don't, they, they seem to take a fairly culturally uniform view of the world. They don't uh, take account of the experience of, of very different cultures and especially of the effects of these media in more repressive societies. There hasn't really been a lot of good work done on, on the effects of new media in those, in those other parts of the world like China, like Iran, like parts of the Arab world, uh, Russia. So we have with us today a stellar cast of experts and commentators and uh, academic researchers who are trying to provide that more nuanced picture of the effect of, of new media in those kinds of societies. And I'll introduce each one in turn as, as, uh, as they speak. Um, our first speaker will be John Kelly, who's the founder of Morningside Analytics. He's an affiliate of the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at the Harvard Law School and also of the Oxford Internet Institute. And he's completing a PhD at Columbia University uh, using innovative techniques that blend social network analysis, content analysis, and statistical analysis to create maps of uh, online discourse and online, online activity in uh, different parts of the world. Uh, so all the, all the work you're about to see kind of started with uh, my dissertation work at Columbia on social network analysis of the uh, English language blogosphere. And it's been a, a series of projects that have led me to uh, in interesting directions, uh, now looking at international blogospheres as well as well. And so we'll start out looking at some of the US stuff to understand the system, kind of the way this, this way of looking at things. And then we'll move on and look at some, uh, some other uh, uh, contexts, international contexts that we've studied, uh, including Iran, which we know the best. Um, and uh, en route, I'm hoping to portray a picture of um, how these networks are complicated. And it's not as simple mapping between authoritarian societies and closed down uh, online public spheres. You can have authoritarian societies with very uh, interesting, lively, engaged public spheres. And uh, you can have some that don't uh, necessarily have that. And uh, 
kind of paint a picture of how complicated it is, but in, in a way also how, how hopeful. Um, but I was warned that I can't just do my usual thing and show a lot of colorful maps that are uh, fun and interesting. Uh, I need to talk a little bit about how this stuff can become useful uh, or might be thought of as a useful tool as well. And so I thought I would start out with uh, something on screen which uh, we have in a, on, on uh, which Morningside produced for the election, which is an example of what you could call kind of a socially intelligent meme tracker. So there are a lot of meme trackers out there that essentially find out what people are talking about online uh, in some, uh, uh, with some amount of force, the things that a lot of bloggers are linking to, et cetera, and kind of move those up on a list so you can go and see what, what the blogosphere is paying attention to. Uh, most of those, however, treat the blogosphere as kind of one haystack, and they look at what across that whole haystack is popular. Uh, and what we do is map out uh, the way that these online public spheres are not a single haystack. They're actually a lot of different haystacks. And each haystack has its own things that it thinks are cool. And so this is an example of a socially intelligent meme tracker. In this case, this one is designed to know the difference between liberals and conservatives. And we see a space here where uh, every dot here represents a YouTube video. And uh, the... Um, uh, Left-right dimension is the proportion of liberal or conservative bloggers that are linking to it. And then how high it is on that graph is how many bloggers are right now linking to it right now on their, on their front page if you went uh, on the internet. And you can play the video and you can also go and see the new ones uh, versus the old ones. This is everything that's within a day, within a week, et cetera. So, this is one way of taking the kinds of maps you're about to see and turning it into tools for understanding what parts of a network are paying attention to what. Uh, and that can be, so this is a specific one based around US politics, uh, but it's arbitrary. It could be any different social <coughs> groups that you want to see what they're paying attention to. So just that basic idea of socially intelligent uh, meme tracker. So now, let me try and start this. I'm, I'm a, um, Please forgive me, I'm a Mac guy, and uh, I'm having to figure out how to, to use this little, uh, I don't know what they call these little red things, these little kind of joystick things. Okay. Anathema. Anathema, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a, a pain in the something. Um, I don't know, is it possible to get these front lights down at all? Uh, should have thought of this. No? Uh, that's good, thank you. So, um, so these are uh, 12 different social network diagrams of online public spheres. Uh, and what, let me just describe a little bit about what's going on in these maps, and uh, then we'll take a look uh, deeper. So on these maps, every dot represents uh, a, a blog or you know, uh, a blog-like thing. Uh, somebody uh, or an organization posting a sequence of, uh, of posts uh, in time. And they're drawn based on looking at the connections among these, uh, these, these online entities. And so uh, we end up seeing the shape of the network, the net network topology, which is a feature of the density of connections among these bloggers. Let's for now just call them bloggers. Uh, and something about this shape represents something about the society that's creating it. Because these dense connections are because people are, for one reason or another, interested in similar things, and they're interested in linking to one another. So they arise uh, around all kinds of organizing principles, from politics to cultural factors to what country uh, you're living in, et cetera. And these are different around the world. Each one of these networks uh, looks different uh, because these societies are different. And um, what we're trying to do is figure out, figure out why. Uh, and hear what some of these languages are. So the first division we make is by language, uh, because in the global network, and I want to stress this is a global network, there are a lot of connections, especially through expatriate bloggers and uh, uh, bilingual and multilingual bloggers who connect public spheres across societies. I first saw this when studying uh, the U.S. technology blogosphere and kept noticing so many bloggers from other countries that were, they were kind of the uber geeks uh, back in, the, in, in their own context, and they were camped on to the Silicon Valley streams of information, translating those back, back home. So you have these international information knowledge flows around technology, and you also find them around politics and other things as well. So uh, I'll just kind of explain the method a little bit in reference to the English language blogosphere, because it's easy to explain. Uh, so this is the English, uh, the, the, this is the top 8,000 blogs in the English language blogosphere uh, you, uh, organized using this method. So every dot here represents a blog. Uh, the size of the dot is how many other bloggers are linking to it. 
And its position is the uh, function of a physics model uh, uh, in which imagine there's a general force like a wind trying to blow all these dots off the map. And any two that are connected by having linked to each other are pulled together as though by a spring or a force of gravity. So these, these network neighborhoods curdle up around densely interconnected bloggers. And this is what it looks like. Uh, secondarily, we put this, the color on the dot. And the color is a different thing. Uh, we monitor these blogs over time, and we uh, look every day at what they're linking to, and then we study those link histories, what it is they've linked to, uh, uh, and we cluster those statistically to find bloggers that are paying attention to the same kinds of other online resources. And that's not just blogs, that's also news sources, NGOs, all kinds of things, everything they link to. So if you're the same color on this map, it means you're paying attention to the same kind of stuff as the other bloggers that are the same color. And then we figure out what it is that they're paying attention to and what they're writing about. And we try and put some labels on it to understand them. So English language uh, is uh, the largest structures are around American politics, uh, conservative and liberal uh, ideology. But you find British bloggers, you find technology bloggers, you find a lot of other things. Uh, also smaller groupings around science, environment, parenting. Even if you look at just the uh, tech, just the uh, uh, political bloggers, you can find some really interesting groups. So there are legal bloggers and security, by which I mean kind of strategic foreign policy studies, who some are on the left and some are on the right, but they're, uh, they're basically uh, uh, elite practitioners or knowledge workers, if you will, that have, uh, are also camped onto similar streams of information that feed uh, that network of practice, say around uh, being a security or foreign policy expert, around being a lawyer, for instance. So we can detect these kinds of networks. Now moving on from the English context, uh, this idea of uh, uh, democracy in the networked public sphere, uh, the extent to which these are more vibrant in authoritarian countries or not, uh, it's worth uh, uh, noting that these networks have distinctly different structures in every society for reasons that have uh, sometimes something to do with politics and, and other times something to do with something else, from, what, from the way their ISPs have evolved to how many countries are there that speak that language, et cetera. Uh, so, just at a glance, you can see differences between the Persian or uh, Farsi Iranian network uh, and the Russian network. And we'll come back uh, to the Russian later, but the Iranian blogosphere is the foreign language blogosphere that we know the best. Uh, there's a study that was released out of Berkman last April, uh, which goes into great detail. It's about 80 pages, and it's a fascinating read, <laughs> at least 20 pages of it. And, um, <laughs> and, 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 and um, what, what uh, it's really, it's, it's, it's worth checking out. And, we did a lot of work to have not just this network, uh, just the computational stuff, but to have uh, 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 Iranian uh, 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 citizens, for the most part, uh, or, or, or uh, some expats, some people who were working with us who wanted to read these and help us code them. So we did a whole layer of, uh, of coding uh, where we had people read these blogs and answer questions and tell us what was going on. And we would sit down. Uh, we, the, the sort of researchers on this, and, and on the Iranian uh, day for the election of the Mashals, we sat there and we looked, we clicked around on this map and we looked at what people were writing about on that day, including uh, some of the, the conservative bloggers. But um, once we put the attentive clustering on it, we can really see that the network breaks out into some different areas. And I know I'm under some time constraints, so I'll, I'll try and speed it up. Um, we found that the part of the Iranian blogosphere you may have heard about, uh, the common story uh, has been that the Iranian blogosphere uh, is dominated by young Democrats who oppose the regime, et cetera, et cetera. And that's certainly the story that you will hear from the people you're likely to talk to who are going to be bilingual or expatriate bloggers. Uh, that's the story that, that they tell because that's the story they know. Uh, there's a tendency of people in these networks, as in any kind of social network, to have a really good picture of the local topology. Who's in your neighborhood you understand really well. Uh, the people who are in another neighborhood you barely know exist. Uh, so taking this global view, we found some interesting things, that the Iranian blogosphere is a very rich and complex space which, in which the people that are uh, most talked about are down here in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, it's the secular uh, uh, and expatriate uh, uh, group, the reformist politics group. Uh, most of these folks are not expatriates, however, they are living in Iran. Uh, I've upwards of about 85% of the ones we sampled were living inside Iran. Uh, and they are writing from a largely reformist uh, uh, or secular point of view. Um, but there are other folks here too. 
Uh, and interestingly, up in the upper left, there's a big cluster around poetry, uh, the mostly Ghazal, the kind of love poetry. Um, there's a mixed network area that has everything from pop culture to uh, kind of minority uh, uh, cultures and et cetera. Uh, down in the lower right was probably the most interesting thing we found, which was the uh, very religious, uh, uh, mostly pro-Islamist uh, uh, political and other bloggers in three very distinct groups. Uh, the ones talking about politics were the ones here in red called Conpol, conservative politics. Uh, they are uh, mostly, uh, they're all very religious. They support the supreme leader. They do not by any stretch all support Ahmadinejad. There's a lot of very contentious debate among these folks, uh, which we found uh, uh, to our surprise. Um, the group 12ers are essentially, it's uh, people who are very uh, fervently um, uh, uh, supporting a uh, very common uh, Shia theological notion of a uh, Mahdi, of the Mahdi, the 12th Imam who will return uh, to rule a perfect earth. It's kind of a, um, uh, a analogous to the second coming of Christ, uh, common belief. Uh, they are uh, fervently expecting that to happen and waiting for it. Um, it's a group that Ahmadinejad courts the approval of. Um, and then there's another group, religious youth, the blue group there, which are mostly younger folks, uh, often college students, that are uh, nonetheless uh, blogging from a very religious perspective. Uh, you can see where Ahmadinejad and Katami's uh, blog and website are in this map. Uh, this was uh, overlaying some data from the Open Net Initiative, uh, which is a collaboration with uh, Berkman and Oxford and some other partners, uh, which looks at uh, what gets filtered where. Uh, so the, on the left, the uh, blogs you see lit up there are the ones that are not visible inside Iran. The government is blocking those. Uh, and on the right are the ones that are visible. So unsurprisingly, the government blocks more in this secular reformist area. Uh, but surprisingly, most of the ones in that area are nonetheless visible uh, to people inside Iran. Uh, and also, the third point is that the reformist stuff is not the only stuff that gets blocked. Uh, it's a little fuzzy on the map, but, but even some of the conservative political bloggers have been blocked. Uh, it, we looked at some of those. In one case, it was for using uh, sort of uh, ethnic slurs against Arabs. And in another case, it was for supporting uh, very, very uh, uh, fervently the idea of the temporary marriages. Um, and then some of the poets get blocked too, uh, and we read some of those, and it's because there's quite a bit of love in that love poetry. Um, so uh, once we see these, once we have these maps, we can also look at well, how are different parts of the network talking about stuff? So in the Iranian network, we can uh, say well, which ones have used the word America in the last uh, uh, period of time? Uh, we see that immediately all the most of the religious bloggers drop out but almost all of the conservative political bloggers stay. Uh, so uh, we can understand uh, uh, both visually but also quantitatively, because these are also represented as numbers, uh, what it is that folks are uh, talking about. Uh, democracy, a lot of the conservative politics bloggers stay in there. Uh, a lot of them, you might be surprised to know, actually talk a great deal about uh, democratic values, but from a different perspective. Um, you can also see other interesting stuff. So a lot of Islam is a major topic of conversation, as is Palestine, though somewhat less. Uh, but you can see how particular corners of the network will often talk about certain things. So in the lower left, you can see Evan Prison, the political prison in Tehran, where uh, they put people that uh, they don't like. Um, the people that talk about it are largely the people that might end up there someday. Um, the 12th Imam, the Mahdi, uh, which I described before, is mostly talked about by that, uh, that, that 12 er group in the lower right. Um, we can also look at, well, what websites do they link to? Uh, so where, is their, where are they getting their news and information, uh, uh, for instance? So the uh, major Iranian sources, Fars News and uh, uh, ISNA, uh, get a lot of attention from uh, the reformists and also from the conservative political bloggers. Uh, Ruse and Boztop, some, uh, some online sources, you can see where they get their uh, attention from. Boztop distinctly uh, gets more, picks up more attention from the conservative side. And then where do they get their news from in an international context? And this is interesting because BBC Persian is probably the largest uh, uh, traditional legacy media uh, uh, organization that gets linked to by Iranian bloggers. Uh, Radio Farda, somewhat less. But look at Wikipedia and YouTube. Uh, these new players, uh, and this is the Farsi language Wikipedia, are quoted across the map. 
and they have a larger footprint uh, than any of the foreign services do. Uh, and uh, we thought that was very interesting. So now just a quick tour through some other, some other countries, and I know we're running out of time, but uh, here's the Arabic blogosphere. Uh, if we, we did some human coding uh, to go and see where, asking our coders to look at where bloggers lived, uh, and we sort of found that it's organized this way. Uh, you've got a big group around Saudi Arabia, the biggest group around Egyptian. Uh, uh, then you also find other groups, uh, uh, Kuwaiti is another group. Uh, I also know Iraq has another a group on there, which is, you're not seeing. But so it's mostly organized around national groupings. Uh, but there are these sort of trading zones that mix bloggers from different countries. And uh, we're doing some qualitative analysis of those right now. Uh, Russian blogosphere, if you just point the same tools at Russia, you get, first of all, something like this, which is incredibly confusing and, and very misleading. Uh, it looks like there are sort of five Russian blogospheres, and what you're seeing are uh, the, essentially the, 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 the fact that the Russian online space is organized around a fundamentally different architecture. Uh, blogs, which are the way most people are doing it, are uh, blog roles and posts. There's sort of two paradigms there. One is who do you link to every, who, who is a permanent link on your page, and who are you linking to in your post uh, as they stream by. Uh, Russia is organized much more the way Facebook is organized, or MySpace, uh, around friends lists and communities, groups, et cetera. And it leads to a much more difficult problem to analyze. Uh, and uh, rather than get bogged down in that, I will simply point out that it is a different architecture, uh, that it is dominated by a series of major players, uh, and that, uh, however, ha ha uh, uh, enable and uh, uh, organize a lot of very small niches. Uh, and how those come together into anything like the kind of global spanning communications you find in a lot of other uh, uh, countries uh, is something we're very interested in. Uh, the Chinese blogosphere, and uh, it, a different visualization engine put this out so the dots look a little different, uh, is also very interestingly organized, uh, largely here around different services. So blog services uh, have more internal links but not the way Russia is, not we're almost all internal. Uh, not if you're on LiveJournal, you pretty much only are linking to LiveJournal. Uh, you still are linking to other services, and we are looking at this map uh, 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 starting now. Um, important to understand that bloggers are not just the whole story. They're only one stratum in a networked uh, information ecosystem. And uh, a lot of what bloggers do in the U.S. is focus, and, and everywhere, is focus attention onto things that are not blogs. So only about 38, 40 percent of links in the U.S. Uh, blogosphere are to other blogs. The rest are to media, to uh, NGOs, to other kinds of online entities, uh, YouTube, et cetera. So blogosphere is kind of like a collective lens for uh, channeling attention onto other things besides blogs. And you can map that out. Uh, analytically. So we, uh, we understand, we, we study the relationship between the blogosphere, its neighborhoods, and what it is they're focusing attention onto. And this is the danger of moving this to a PC, which means some of my images are probably going to die. Uh, I'm, okay, so it's good, it cuts down some time. So, so uh, the, we saw before the image of who's linking to Evan Prison. So there's a lot of data behind this stuff. So on the right you see a, uh, a profile, a preference profile for a particular cluster of the blogosphere, and we can say, well, what is everything that they are linking to preferentially? And uh, everything that is high up there on the y-axis going uh, up north are things that everybody links to. That's YouTube, that's Wikipedia, et cetera. The things that end up uh, distributed out to the right are the things that that cluster of people are paying particular attention to. And so uh, in this case, Evan Prison would be just one example of a dot out there. So uh, that is. What you see on the left represents a single dot on the right, and then what you see on the right represents a single column of something like this. So you can create a very detailed understanding of what the preferences are for linking uh, across this map. Um, and that's what that is. Um, how much time do I have? Do I have any time? Two more minutes. Two more minutes. Okay, let me wrap up. So um, I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, what this sort of understanding might lead one to think in terms of action. And I think that there are some environmental goals, some, some uh, how would one promote a healthy online public sphere, um, and uh, a few ideas. One, infrastructure, I mean, to, for, to create a network of people that are linking to information, uh, the information has to be linkable. It has to be there. 
Uh, it has to have the right kinds of hooks, the right kinds of uh, uh, social media tools to make it sticky, easy to pick up and, and, and to link to. Uh, you also need the kind of uh, uh, infrastructure uh, in terms of uh, bloggers and uh, meme trackers and search engines that enable that environment to thrive. Uh, but maybe more importantly, you need uh, what, what I uh, want to call oxygen. So uh, you have to have the energy, the oxygen in this network, to get people interested in doing it. So uh, part of that is kind of a social capital thing. I mean, in, you know, bloggers in the U.S. are motivated by all kinds of reasons. A lot of it is basically social capital. Some of it is money. But, you know, uh, it, 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 if I'm a, a high-profile blogger, I have a role in my community of fellow uh, uh, practitioners of whatever my practice is, if I'm a law blogger, if I'm an a international politics blogger. I'm motivated by that network of relationships, both with the people around me, kind of my fellow knowledge workers, uh, but also by the chance for maybe some publicity. Maybe what I have to say will get picked up uh, in a more high-profile par uh, part of the food chain uh, journalists might contact me for stories. I know that I'm part of, I'm very aware that I'm part of an information ecosystem where I've got some jazz. Uh, so you need that oxygen in terms of the social capital. Uh, I think, for instance, what Global Voices does in the international context is great because if you go to one of the conferences, what you see is these folks are not, are no longer isolated uh, in their, they're, they're, they're now networked with a group of people that are, uh, with whom they, they they can share knowledge and, and gain resources and uh, gain support and just gain the, the community the motivation to take part in things. Um, oxygen also means that there has to be some kind of a porous border between the official media, the legacy media, and the network media ecosystem. So, you know, you have to be, have some chance of your intellectual activity uh, gaining a wider audience. You don't have to, but that is another form of the oxygen. Uh, and then understanding is simply, you know, the kinds of intelligence you can get on the space by doing this sort of analysis to understand who's talking about what where. And in terms of taking action, I think that, you know, a lot of the way that this is applied is not in this global understanding mode. It's in, well, finding out who is talking about what. I mean, most of the folks that you would be likely to work with, I imagine, have their issues. They have the things that they care about. Well, those conversations are happening somewhere in these networks. And you don't have to worry about all the people blogging about football. You can find the people that are blogging or that uh, show signs of being attentive to the thing you care about and map them specifically and go find them. Once you find them, you can understand the way they think of the issues, uh, the context of their discussions, what are they paying attention to, how do they talk about things. Uh, we can mine language to understand the key words, the key terms that people are using in different parts of the network. So you want the people that you're working with to be able to understand the ecosystem around their issues. Uh, and help, this also helps them find allies, who are the people they ought to be networking with and reaching out to. Uh, and finding those allies helps build their capacity, and ultimately it helps them shift the debate uh, in whatever the, 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 the network is uh, that they want to engage with around the issue that they care about. Thanks, John. <clears throat> I, I have lots of questions, and I'm sure the audience, people in the audience do too, but we'll save those for after each of the panelists have spoken. So next up is uh, Ethan Zuckerman, who is a well-known and well-loved face at, at OSI. He's the founder of Geek Corps and the global blog aggregation site, Global Voices Online. Ethan is a fellow at the Berkman Center and uh, a prolific blogger as well at, at my heart's at a, in a, my heart's in a crop. Over to you. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm a very visual guy. It's very strange for me to sit in front of one of these panels and not show slides. But I presented with John before, and I learned my lesson. And I know that there's nothing that I'm going to show you that's nearly as pretty as what John shows. So <laughs> I'm just going to wave my hands and talk, which is not my usual mo. I, I'm also going to play the role here of anecdote guy because John's work is really sort of about putting together really large sets of data and making sort of general conclusions from it. I, I'm going to take really tiny sets of data and make equally broad sweeping conclusions about <laughs> it with a lot less methodological rigor. This is a real <laughs> academic, this is a para-academic, and this is how this stuff works out. But in reacting to what John put forward, I, I, I want to react to a, a, a couple of things in turn and, and maybe broaden this idea of what happens in constrained and sometimes repressive blogospheres. Um, let me first say that I think one of the things that uh, you may be seeing in the Iranian models are a function of when in time 
this analysis has been done. Um, so one of the things that we saw at Global Voices that's been pretty fascinating is a shift from what we characterized as bridge blogging activity to sort of native blogging activity. So if we sort of roll back time to say 2003, 2004, it wasn't all that uncommon to find people, for instance, in the Arabic blogosphere blogging primarily in English. And this had a lot to do with the fact that there just wasn't that much of an Arabic speaking audience online at that point. If you wanted to talk to somebody, you were going to talk in a language that people spoke. And I remember hanging out with Jordanian bloggers and essentially saying, well, wait, you guys are all much more comfortable in Arabic. Why aren't you writing in Arabic? And they would sort of look around and say, well, these are the Arabic speakers. You know, we'd like to reach someone else beyond that. What's interesting is the level of net penetration in Iran and sort of how quickly it came on. So my guess is one of the reasons that we sort of over-focus on these liberal reformist bloggers isn't just that we desperately want there to be a reformist movement in Iran and we want these folks to be blogging, but it's actually sort of who was first to the game, who we started paying attention to. Our experience around Global Voices is that this bridging state may actually just be a phase. It may be what happens when there isn't much of a local blogosphere. Once you can start writing and talking to a local audience, you are less compelled to sort of reach out internationally and speak to an international audience. It doesn't disappear entirely, but that motivation changes and shifts a little bit. Um, and it seems like it's actually much easier to address the local audience than it is to address the global audience. So one thing to think about might be time series on this stuff. I wanted to talk a little bit about significantly less rich and less defined blogospheres. Because one of these things, and, and this is sort of an American tendency, we sort of look at the Iranian blogosphere and say, well, that must be tremendously repressive. And in terms of how many individual blogs are blocked, that's true. It's one of the more highly censored, more highly filtered environments. But I, I want to talk briefly about how Ethiopia eliminated blogging, all of it. Um, Ethiopia in 2004, 2005 had an incredibly lively blogosphere. Uh, this has a lot to do with Ethiopian political culture, where there are arguments that have been going on since the 1950s. Uh, my friends who study Ethiopia seriously tell me that there are debates that sort of started during these wonderful meetings in Paris about sort of post-colonial Africa, where everybody else would go out drinking together, and the Ethiopians would stay at a table yelling at each other, and now their <laughs> grandchildren are having exactly the same arguments, but sort of continuing <laughs> to find ways to yell at one another. So you have these highly polarized positions. The tendency in the Ethiopian blogosphere is you put up an assertion and it's responded to with pages and pages of commentary. So people who've sort of stumbled into this find themselves you know, getting entire essays in response to a single link that they've put up. So in 04 and 05, we were all sort of looking at this and saying, well, this is fascinating. This is going to be the most politically rich, the most rigorous African blogosphere. We're all enjoying watching this. And then it died. Uh, and it died almost immediately. And, and what happened was, in the wake of nonviolent demonstrations, which were broken up with live gunfire in 2005, Ethiopia first blocked SMS messaging, because that's what mobilized people out into the streets. And they actually turned off SMS for a little more than two years. Uh, a government that turns off SMS is sort of on a very, very high repression scale. This is a tool that 99.7% of the time is not being used to overthrow a government. It's a very practical thing. And if you're willing to turn it off, you're basically at a very, very high level of paranoia about your, your uh, political space organizing itself. But Ethiopians then went a little bit further and had ETC, the wonderful Ethiopia Telecommunications Corporation, block not just the individual high profile blogs of people, uh, but blogger.com, which at that point was the most popular blogging platform. Now, there was a small enough population in Ethiopia that was blogging that groups like Global Voices were able to reach out, reach out to those individual bloggers and say, hey, we can help you continue to post. Here's how you use a proxy server. Here's how you continue to maintain it. What we were not able to do was figure out how to get proxy servers and such out to the audience. So what you ended up with was a couple of bloggers who continued posting, but they were only being read by the diaspora. They weren't being read by anyone in Ethiopia anymore. The comments fell off. The notion that they were actually engaged with the dialogue fell off. Then you had a heavy dose of personal intimidation 
One of the best bloggers in the country in 2005 was an Italian woman. She was actually the wife of a diplomat who blogged as uh, Addis Ferengi. And she was uh, detained, threatened, told that her husband would be kicked out of the country if she continued blogging. She ceased blogging, started blogging again once she was back in Italy. But that was sort of the death knell. Um, so we reached this point about sort of six months after the sort of peak of the space where suddenly every interesting Ethiopian blog was blocked and killing off that audience was essentially shutting off the oxygen that John is talking about. It turns out that if no one is reading your blog, you will stop blogging. None of us are so tone deaf that if no one is listening to us after three months, we're not going to stop doing this. And particularly in the political blogosphere, that's a big one. Let me talk really briefly uh, about a couple of other spaces that I think are, are just sort of interesting to think about in contrast. Zimbabwe, so I'm an Africanist, so a lot of these are going to be Africa examples. Zimbabwe um, has a surprising, thriving blogosphere, which is extremely prominently anti-government. And one of the problems we have with Global Voices is that we try pretty hard to give you a balanced view of what bloggers are saying in a country. The trick in Zimbabwe is that there's one ZANU-PF blogger. He's a really sweet guy. He's a dear old friend of mine. His name is Dumasani Nioni, but there's one of him. And everybody else is an MDC blogger. Uh, for the most part, they're significantly wealthier. For the most part, they're white. Um, they're from a very different socioeconomic strata than the average Zimbabweans. If you look at Zimbabwe through blogs, you're going to end up with this impression that people would like to throw Mugabe out tomorrow. And, and actually, the picture is far, far more complicated than that. Um, even in you know, MDC's version of the election, it's unlikely that MDC got more than 55% of the votes. There's still a large rural population that supports the old man. What's interesting is that when you come at this from the blog space, you would miss it entirely because of who's blogging. What's interesting about this is that Zimbabwe probably has the ability to constrain access to a lot of online speech. They have highly centralized ISPs. They have a very well-developed state security apparatus. They've threatened, they've banned my blog, for instance, Global Voices, within Zimbabwe. But it's not blocked. Uh, the last time that I was in Zimbabwe, I was able to access all of these sites. We continue to monitor uh, through OpenNet uh, initiative. And none of these highly controversial, highly critical blogs are blocked. We think the reason for this is that these blogs have basically zero political influence. They're reaching the 5% of people who have enough money that they're capable of you know, already doing things like subscribing to the Mail and Guardian in South Africa, which is significantly more critical than any of these blogs are going to be. But someone who is sort of high enough that they're able to access the internet on a regular basis, read the blogs, keep up with the news that way, is already so far from ZANU-PF's power base that it's almost not worth going after them at that point. Um, let me mention two more things sort of in passing. I'm really looking forward to John's work on the Chinese blogosphere because almost everything we know about the rest of the world sort of breaks down once we move into China. One of the biggest things that breaks down is how censorship works. Generally speaking, um, we expect censorship to sort of work within a blogosphere. You look at what blogs and what news sources are in place, and you block either individual, potentially controversial sites. So you go to all of blogspot.com and you say, these 10 blogs are really highly critical. We're going to block them. Or you get much, much more aggressive and you say, we're going to block blogger.com. We're simply not going to let you access this entire service. There's a high social cost in blocking blogger.com or blocking youtube.com. If you're interested in this, Google the cute cat theory. This is a talk that I've been giving for the last year or so. And it basically says that one of the reasons it's so hard for Pakistan to show up and block YouTube is that 97% of people going to YouTube aren't looking for political information. They're looking for that video of the cat flushing the toilet. And when you block YouTube.com, Everyone who went to look at the cute cat video suddenly goes, wait a second, I'm living in a repressive state. What are they blocking me from seeing? 
So you actually sort of raise the interest in this. China does this really differently and really, really well. China basically blocks all social media tools that we know, but there are Chinese equivalents of all these social media tools. So you wouldn't really want to go to Flickr anyway because it's in an English language interface. Here's something with a really nice Chinese language interface. You'd rather use that tool. Unfortunately, that tool has censorship baked into it. And by baked in, we mean you go to Microsoft's blogging service in China, MSN Spaces, and you enter in a blog title of, I love freedom, human rights, and democracy, and you get back the message in Chinese saying, your blog title may not uh, contain obscenity or other prohibited language. Please choose another blog title. Uh, Rebecca McKinnon, my, my research partner, has a wonderful set of papers on this. So what we're seeing in China is actually a move back from sort of web 2.0 technologies like blogging back into web 1.0 or at least this is the theory that Michael Ante, who's a very prominent Chinese dissident, puts forward. He basically says, because these things are so centralized, because they're so controlled, because they're so easy to monitor, they don't make sense as loci for democratic speech. We're going to see people going back to bulletin board systems. We're going to see people using chat lines. We're going to see people using much less centralized and, frankly, much less effective technologies for disseminating this. But because it's less centralized, it's not as easy to censor. So one thing in closing, and this isn't about a repressive nation, this is about why blogging matters and why actually it's sort of very encouraging to see the level of civic discourse in a place like Iran. Um, folks who follow Kenya know that Kenya had an extremely tumultuous political period uh, starting basically on Boxing Day of last year and sort of going through February. Kenya is a remarkably open sub-Saharan African society, very high degree of press freedom, actually high degree of press function. And what was really interesting was to watch what happened as you had an intergovernmental struggle between a government that I think probably could be legitimately described as seizing and holding power over an opposition. While the government did seize and hold power, it didn't shut down SMS. Instead, it responded by sending out a message essentially saying, you know, please be careful about going out in the streets and don't hurt anyone, which was still viewed as, as sort of very controversial speech. There was a broadcast ban for about two days where broadcast television, radio, print were not producing real-time news. But the bloggers were. And what was very interesting about this was that Kenya now has probably the most robust best integrated African blogosphere. There's two, 3,000 bloggers. There's good networks. Uh, there's an award system. Awards turn out to be really important in the blogosphere. When you've got a group that can sort of give each other awards, it actually shows a high degree of function. What happened was bloggers who are not political suddenly became incredibly political. So you had a blogger like Bankalele and you read Bankalele if you're trading in the Kenyan stock market. This guy is an insider at a Kenyan investment bank. Um, he's an amazing way of sort of tracking whether or not you should be buying or selling Kenya Airways. He suddenly shifted over to being this incredible high-level political analyst. Uh, a guy named Dowdy Were, mental acrobatics, uh, is a tech blogger. He's just a geek. Uh, but he jumped out into the streets with his camera and started getting into the face of demonstrations and doing sort of amazing original photojournalism. So what I love about this Kenyan story is that blogging the vast majority of time is pretty banal. Most of the time, you just don't care. But what's really interesting is that when you hit a crisis situation, Kenya seems to demonstrate that in a robust blogosphere where people are paying attention to one another, there's the possibility that this online media can rapidly become an, a, 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 a highly political alternative and sometimes dissident media. So I think that's something to consider in all of these maps that you're looking at with John, where you're looking at this and saying, well, isn't this really odd? You know, nine-tenths of this picture isn't anything that I would care about. That other nine-tenths, if it's well interconnected, if it's high functioning, may actually be sort of a media network waiting to happen if it, if it needs to come into play. Um, so why don't I stop there? Thanks, Ethan. Our next uh, panelist is Parachista Hakpur. Parachista was born in Iran but raised in the U.S. and now lives in, in here in New York City. Uh, she's a journalist who's 
work has appeared in the New York Times, The Village Voice, and The Dune and other publications. And she's also a novelist who's just published uh, a year ago, I believe, uh, Sons and Other Flammable Objects. Thank you. Can you hear me? Oh, am I off? Ah, okay. Can you hear me now? So, uh, here? Testing? Here. Oh, no, that's but fine. I said I don't hear it. Oh, oh, okay. It's, it's, no, it's, it's coming it's, now, it's, it's actually. Okay. It's voice. I see it. Um, okay, so if Ethan is going to give a tiny disclaimer after John, I have to give a less tiny one after John and Ethan. Um, I, I have to say that I'm going to, is it, it's still off? Yeah. Okay, let me switch. Okay. Is this better? Yep. I don't want double mic now. <laughs> okay. Um, I am a fiction uh, writer and not a media authority of any sort, so I think I have to say that. So I'm going to talk from a very pers personal perspective and maybe at times a little bubblegum perspective too, so forgive me. Um, I'll give a few stories and talk about my connection with um, the Iranian uh, blogosphere um, as an Iranian-American, a former blogger, um, and someone who's in touch with a lot of Iranian bloggers um, in Iran and outside of Iran. Um, one thing I've done in the last, since my novels come out, is that last year I created the Goodreads group, Literature of, the, of Iran and the Diaspora. Um, and as of last night, we had about 150 members and 106 books listed, which is really not much, actually, compared to some of the other Iranian groups. The Rumi group actually has 917 people. It's pretty incredible. Um, I'm, I am the moderator, but I really don't do much. It's kind of taken off without me. Um, if you don't know what Goodreads is, just a few words about that. It's a networking and social cataloging website um, for book lovers that started about two years ago um, in Santa Monica, California. And, and users create reading lists, personal libraries, and book groups. And last January in the LA Times, they reported that one-fifth of Goodreads users were Iranian, um, which was kind of incredible uh, to me. And that's why I started my group. I, I wanted to figure out who the Iranians word that were on the site. Um, it was definitely, at that point, off the Iranian government's um, radar because it was relatively small and it was about books and not politics. So, you know, why block it? Um, eventually, it did get blocked by, by certain service providers, it seems. Um, but like Ethan spoke to, um, proxy servers made it very easy to get around that. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I'm doing currently. Um, a little bit about me and the web as an Iranian-American. I, I am of that group that came to the US um, at the advent of the Iran-Iraq war. Um, I was here in the US when I was three, but born in Tehran. Um, and I still remember when my, my dad, who was a sort of technologically unsavvy scientist, um, got us our first computer in 1994, which felt pretty late, actually. And, I still remember getting obsessed with Prodigy and its crappy web browsers and uh, America Online and all that. And I immediately became a huge internet geek, uh, mostly because I was still in a, I had a very traditional Iranian family. I wasn't allowed to sleep over at people's houses. I wasn't allowed to go to school dances or anything. So I became obsessed with chat rooms. Uh, they really shaped me, um, you know, not uh, mostly very nerdy chat rooms, you know, nothing, nothing, you know, salacious <laughs> in any way, but I, it really shaped me in a big way and, and started my internet addiction. Um, eventually, college and grad school were off periods from internet use, but eventually in 2003, I kept getting invites to a social network service called Friendster. I kept getting invites over and over, and I hated the name. I found it so unappealing, Friendster is icky. And finally, I joined it. And it was huge for me. I, I, it was the first time I'd ever been on a site like that. And I re rediscovered all these old friends, uh, you know, even found a boyfriend via it, you know. And by 2004, I actually ended up moving uh, to Chicago to be a staff writer at the Chicago Reader. Um, and it was a work from home job. So. I, my internet addiction got worse and worse because I was pretending to work part of the time, but the rest of the time I was on, online. And eventually friends of mine sort of peer pressured me into live journal. And I started a live journal, which was my first stint at blogging in 2004. Uh, it felt really infantile. I, you know, I was in my mid-20s at that point, but everyone on it seemed to be in their 20s and 30s and 40s. You know, it wasn't, didn't seem that weird. Um, and so I, I became a, a live journal blogger under an alias, mostly because I was still worried my parents would discover 
the real me. Um, so uh, I made lots of friends, some you know, virtual and real, some who still know me by that alias, uh, which is strange. And then the, I, I stopped that in 2005 when I moved to a community that didn't recognize live journal as much. That was Los Angeles for some reason. Um, that also in, interests me, different places in even this country where different things are popular at different times. Um, it wasn't in Los Angeles. In the summer of 2007, right before my debut novel came out, I decided to start a blog again. But uh, admittedly, because I was too cheap to get an author website, uh, my publishers wouldn't pay for you know a fancy author website. So and at that point, I had really go, plowed through my advance. So I got a blog spot. And it was a little embarrassing. It lasted for a year because I was only using it for promotional purposes, really. I mean, telling people about things like this, you know, come see me here, or I did this article there, and it, I wasn't blogging properly. Um, so I, I shut it down after a year, and I'm considering blogging again. I do it sporadically right now at redroom.com, which is an online home for authors. Of course, I'm glued to Facebook with my 687 friends and their constant status updates, and I constantly consider Twitter. I'm, I'm always on the verge. Um, and, I, and this winter, I'm actually, for a publication, going to check myself into an internet addiction rehab. Um, I'm not joking, actually, an inpatient facility, because the four to eight hours at least I spend on top of a full-time job are just getting a little out of hand. Um, part of it has been being obsessed with Iranian blogs. Um, there, there's several blogs I look at uh, constantly. One is the very popular Iranian.com. Um, it's an online English language magazine founded in the mid-90s by Jahan Javid. Um, and it's got, I think, the long, largest online following among Iranians residing in North America. My, my stats might be a little bit um, old, but I believe it's still around 660,000 unique visitors and nearly 6 million page views per month. So it's fairly huge. Um, and it's recently gone Web 2.0. Um, right now, people are you know, having their own blogs on it. They're uploading all sorts of unique um, content without much monitoring and certainly no censorship within Iran and outside of Iran. Um, another blog I, I, I look at is a, it's called Life Goes On in Tehran. It's a personal monthly photo blog by a former Los Angeles um, resident who's now moved to Tehran, an, an Iranian-American who's now identifying really as an Iranian only. And uh, he's featuring photos taken by a camera phone almost exclusively. It's a wonderful site if you haven't seen it. His mission is to show that regardless of what any president would have you imagine, despite what any media outlet would have you believe, life goes on in Tehran and elsewhere in Iran. Um, and it's never overtly a political um, a site, although he, once in a while he sneaks in things. Um, I also look at Pars Arts, an independent English language site um, highlighting Iran Iranian life abroad. It's an Iranian-American site that's fixated primarily on um, entertainment um, and arts. Um, another one I'm interested in is ddmmyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyy
And of course, recently, um, one's about Esha Momeni, um, the Iranian-American activist who uh, was arrested in Iran in mid-October. I just asked a couple of these Iranian bloggers just for their thoughts um, about this, because I, I told them I'm going to be talking here. And I just wanted to just hear what they had to say about some of the issues that we'd, we were going to bring up today. Um, and David Yaroubi of DDMM, why, why, why? He's going to hate me when he sees that I butchered this, but sorry, David. Um, he says that he thinks blogs died a while ago, um, and now it's all about Web 2.0. He especially points to Yahoo 360, um, which I think is not so popular here. I mean, I, I, I feel like I'd be addicted to it if it was, but it's, it's you know, he's, he's completely obsessed with Yahoo 360. He says Orkut, Facebook, Flickr, Goodreads. Um, this is the new revolution, and it should be titled The Proxy Evolution, which I love. Um, uh, he, has, he says there is really still no problem setting up the proxy servers and getting around um, all the blocking. Um, the, I, I, can't, I have to reject the name of it, the Life Goes On in Tehran guy. Let's call him A. Um, he also talks about the Iranian character um, the pride of Iranians, and Iranians always loving to talk about themselves and their culture and always trying to break stereotypes and loving to present themselves. Um, and he says that's kind of kept the blogosphere fueled and going. Um, actually, A says that he started the photo blog, uh, Life Goes On in Tehran, mostly for the West's benefit. Um, he, wants, he wanted his Western friends to see what life in Iran was really like. And he's very proud of the weekly emails he gets from people that write and say, oh, I had no idea this was what you know, Iran was like. Um, and, and A also talks about what David talked about, too, about how all these, especially so the social networking sites, uh, are there because there's no place for young people to hang out. Um, there is no public nightlife. They, they both say this. In my imagination, I thought that. But I kept thinking, there must be something we don't know about. And they, they say it over and over. These are you know, young, active folks with lots of friends. Um, so they, they say Yahoo 360 becomes like a cyber bar. Um, and in that way, I think of Goodreads as a cyber coffee house, I guess, in some ways. Um, and you know, life goes on in Tehran, he, he's, the camera phone's been wonderful for him because he can sneak into house parties and take photos discreetly so we can see what that nightlife, the private nightlife, is like. Um, on the flip side, A also writes about the incidental benefit of the diaspora who also write to him often and thank him for linking their past with this present Iran that they don't know. So it's had that function too that I think is interesting. Um, basically, in closing, I just I, just to address why Iranians love the internet so much. You know, my theory is based on a few facts and figures. I think this has been written about a lot, but we have to remember that modern technology was early on embraced by Iranians as a tool of social change. I mean, the '79 revolution, uh, cassette tapes, and um, fax machines played a huge part. If you remember, uh, Khomeini was in France in exile. And people were getting a lot of his um, speeches and rhetoric through these tapes. Um, so it's, it's, Iranians have always been hip to modern tech. Um, and of course, there was this major crackdown on print media um, during Khatami's second term, around 2000, 2001. Uh, more than 57 newspapers were shut down, leaving 1,500 press workers unemployed, at least. Um, so what do they do? They go to electronic media, of course. Um, and then, of course, you have to remember, Iran has an interesting demographic. 40% uh, of Iran's population is between 15 to 35. That's, that's the figure they, they throw around a lot. Um, so that this whole cyber sphere has been embraced by the youth, which is a considerable part of the population. Um, I'm always amazed at, at figures I get about Iran having the highest percentage of internet users in the entire Middle East. Um, and then second is Israel. I think it's incredible. Um, and when the first blogs came out in, in late 2001, it was only two years later that it, they, Iran became the fastest growing cyberspace in the Middle East. Um, Iran is ninth in the world for the number of blogs, but it's still you know, on the list of the 15 enemies of the internet. So I. I that's always interesting to me, too. Um, 
Also, it, it, in 2004, um, when some further crackdowns and restrictions were happening, it, the, a poll by an Iranian blogger revealed that Iranians trust the web more than radio, TV, satellite channels, press, and foreign-based radio, even though in 2004 only 5 to 10 percent of Iranians were active in cyberspace. That's pr pretty extraordinary that they have this trust in this idea even. And I, I often hear from relatives, too, about how Iran is filled with graffiti of URLs, which is <laughs> nerdiest graffiti ever. Um, <laughs> so obviously, I referred to 2003, 2004, um, and the government cracking down hugely then. Um, but remember that it was just shortly after that the mullahs themselves started setting up their blogs. And of course, Ahmadinejad right now is probably the most popular Iranian blogger of all time, right, after he set his, up his blog in 2006. It all kind of makes sense to me in closing when I think of the Iranian character, too. I think Iranians love the anonymity of the web. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, what I'll try to do in my um, concluding talk is try to do the impossible and try to tie all of this uh, three previous talk together and in a policy framework. Uh, so uh, I think by now, by 2008, uh, we have more or less uh, all agreed that the web could be a powerful force, right? There is still a lot of disagreement uh, whether it is a force for good, a force for uh, much more uh, dangerous forces, which we see in many of these authoritarian countries, right? And I think the battle we would see over the next four or five years uh, on the web uh, would operate from the assumption that, you know, the web is here to stay. I think the anecdote of Ethiopia that Ethan mentioned, um, it's uh, a good anecdote, but I think uh, we'll be seeing less and less of that and more and more of countries and governments uh, accepting the web as a given and trying to figure out a way in which they can actually make it work for them without necessarily censoring it or without necessarily uh, you know, taking some actions which would disrupt these networks. Mm -hmm. right? So I think it is a given and we have to operate uh, based on that assumption first. Right? I think the question then for uh, a lot of policy organizations is, uh, you know, given that the web is there to stay, I mean, what could we do, right? And um, here I think research like John Kelly's is very helpful because, you know, it helps us to uh, understand and visualize how those networks work and how information can propagate and flow between those networks, right? Um, uh, the danger here is that uh, since networks usually are, you know, more or less neutral, all sorts of other information can flow through the networks, right? So by focusing on building the infrastructure, right, and getting people online, there is always this inherent danger that, you know, the bad guys would be taking advantage of the very same infrastructure to spread their own messages, right? And there is as much danger that it would be the governments uh, who already accepted that the web is here to stay, who would be finding ways in which to manipulate public discussion online, right? And we have seen a few examples of that happening happening, um, you know, the practice of astroturfing that, you know, exists here in the U.S. where a lot of companies are trying to present, you know, public discourse, supposedly public discourse as something uh, uh, which, you know, is natural rather than created by PR companies. We see more and more of that happening on the web where uh, there is this famous case in China of the so-called 50 cent party you know, of people who are supposedly being paid 50 cents per hour to comment on various forums and blogs and leave messages which are supportive of the government, which are supportive of the government ideology, right? And uh, there is also evidence that there may be similar units operating in Russia who are affiliated with the government, whether it's direct affiliation or whether it is uh, indirect. Uh, cooperation, but there are entities and units which are eager to support and push for the government um, ideology online, right? So we have to be very well aware of the fact that all those networks we may be investing in and all those networks which we want to create could be potentially misused like any, like any others. And the governments would be the first one who, uh, you know, have the resources and have the knowledge often uh, to go and start openly uh, exploiting them. Right? Um, so this is one thing. Another thing which I think we have to be cognizant of is that um, a lot of 
platforms exist, right? It's not just blocks. And as you know, Parachista mentioned, you know, in Iran it may be a site like Goodreads, right, which bloggers would discover and try to hide from authorities without being blocked, right? And that reflects a much broader trend that the most interesting content and the most sensitive content that organizations like OSI or others would want to look at, it would usually be hidden from public view. Because if you are working on human rights issues, or if you are working on social justice issues in these countries, and if you are blogging, the first precaution you would normally take, often, would be to say, I want to be you know, in a closed garden rather than in a walled garden, rather than openly in the public, because that would get me in trouble. So in Russia, for example, the reason why LiveJournal took off is that it really helps you to separate who your friends are from the general public. So your blog and your community can be read only by people whom you approve of, you know, to whom you authorize to read it. Um, and this is slightly different from the way standalone blogs like WordPress or Typepad operate here in the US and sort of English language blogs. And I think you have to understand is that a lot of analysis, for example, which people like John have been doing, it looks at a lot of things which are public and which are available and which can be crawled and which can be analyzed. But you know, people who we are most interested in, they actually always three or four steps ahead of us because they want to be, they want to remain secretive and they don't want to be public. And this applies equally to the bad guys, you know, people who are, you know, Al Qaeda and the rest. You know, they are using the secure forums. Many of them are not using public operations, right? So analysis would always lag behind, and that would, there would always be delay, and there would always be gaps in that, right? Um, but the general question, I think, is a good one. How do you build a robust blogosphere, right? And I think Ethan made a very good point about Kenya, uh, saying that, you know, the more about the blogosphere, the more chances we have that whatever conflicts happen, even if the mainstream media goes black, they will still be covered by the bloggers. And, you know, and here we, we've had this exchange with Ethan on, uh, you know, the war in South Ossetia and how it has been, uh, in my view, misreported or underreported by citizen journalists and new media, in part because there was no infrastructure and there was no robust networks of bloggers in Georgia or South Ossetia. And on top of that, there was no often electricity or, you know, internet infrastructure to start with, right? So the question here, I think, uh, is a good one. How do you create, if you, if you really want to amplify the voices of the reasonable people in South Ossetia or in Georgia, how do we build networks which would allow to amplify uh, already existing voices? And I think that's a question where John Research can help us, but it's still a very difficult and essentially uh, a very complex question. You know, we had um, a meeting uh, in Georgia, in Tbilisi, inviting, uh, with Darius present there, you know, inviting people from Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan to give country presentations of what's happening uh, in, you know, their own national blogospheres. And our understanding was that, for example, Armenia and Azerbaijan and that was around mid-June, so it was before the war. So Armenia and Azerbaijan were very, well, more or less well-developed blogospheres. They had social networks, diaspora played a huge role, there were a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of Azeri bloggers are present on Iranian platforms, a lot of Azeri bloggers are present on Turkish networks, a lot of them are present on uh, Russian networks, the Armenian diaspora is helping the Armenian blogosphere. With Georgia, it seemed like there was very little interaction either with the diaspora or with Russian bloggers because of the language issue, or with anyone else outside of Georgia. And the blogosphere itself seemed very underdeveloped from, 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 from my perspective, for example. But then the question is, what are the concrete steps that we could do to make this network bigger, or to make sure that journalists finally start to block, or that public intellectuals in Georgia start to block, or you know that blogging suddenly goes mainstream. There are many factors here, and the, I think the word ecosystem here is, 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 is the correct one because you know unless, for example, journalists see a direct incentive in blogging, they would never start blogging. And before journalists join, others wouldn't because you know there have to be payoffs, and these payoffs have to be uh, obvious and visible. If your blog is read by five people, and if there are only seven bloggers in the country, chances are if you can write a newspaper article, and if you can write an NGO report, you will still write an NGO report rather than you know, post to a blog because it's just not visible and it's not read. Then the question is how do we create better institutions or platforms uh, for this content to be discovered? Um, 
and, you know, regarding the question of censorship, uh, I think it is an important question, but we also have to realize that very often, and particularly more often, now we see much more sophisticated and subtle means of discouraging uh, people from blogging. And I'll give you a very interesting example uh, from uh, LiveJournal and f from, from, from Russia and, and, and Georgia specifically. Uh, the most credible voice uh, who was providing very insightful comment on the war in South Ossetia uh, was uh, a Georgian blogger who was a refugee from Abkhazia in the first war in the 90s, uh, who was blogging on Live Journal, uh, very critical of what Moscow was doing, also very critical of what Saakashvili was doing, but more or less uh, a guy with a very interesting and insightful perspective, who was commanding on a lot of local events with a very interesting analysis. Uh, he was widely read uh, by Russian bloggers and by Russian media because he was doing all of that in Russian. So that was one of the few voices uh, that were doing this. What happened is that uh, about a month ago, there was suddenly a flurry of uh, cyber attacks against his blog. Somebody basically hired, uh, you know, uh, you can actually go and hire now this uh, uh, denial of service attackers. So, so you can go and pay a very you know, minimal sum of money, hire an attacker, uh, hire whatever, a botnet, a network of computers, and then they launched an attack which was so powerful that the administrators of LiveJournal had nothing else to do but to remove his account for LiveJournal to continue operating. Right? The attack was so powerful that you know, people who administer uh, you know, probably a million blogs had no other way to make sure that the site, the whole site, all million blogs stay online other than to ask him to leave the platform and take all of his content with him. Right? So the guy moved to WordPress.com, another blogging platform, where he was also subject of attacks and he was also silenced down because administrators found nothing that they could do to keep the entire platform online. Right, so that's basically, uh, you know, would it show up on any of the open net initiative maps? I don't know. You know, it was a very short, you know, live journals unavailable for one hour, right? It may not show up, but the bottom line is that, you know, a very critical and interesting voice has been silenced basically through you know, almost extortion and blackmailing the administrators, telling them, you remove him or, you know, will continue attacking, right? Who stands behind these attacks? It's very hard to know because most of them are anonymous. You know, whether it is nationalists, and we've seen it a lot during the cyber dimension to the war in South Ossetia, whether it's nationalists who are cooperating online, relying on the same very tools, blogs, and forums to target such critical voices and to targets as such dissenting voices. We don't know, but we see more and more evidence of this happening. So I think uh, we are looking in the right direction um, by trying to visualize and map all of that. We just have to be uh, sure that uh, you know, we not only rely on anecdotal evidence, but we also actively reach out and see what are some of the ways in which people are being asked to, uh, you know, keep silent or are being, uh, uh, you know, censored. Whether it's soft censorship or whether it's hard censorship, it's a difficult question. But uh, my concern is that we see the governments, instead of just solely relying on censorship as they did in the past, actually trying to uh, find very interesting, subtle, and sophisticated strategies which take advantage of the internet to solidify the already existent uh, authoritarian regimes. And I think that's the biggest battle we'll see in the next five, 10 years. Uh, it will be whether you know, the activists eventually manage to turn the internet into something more than just a tool for mobilizing people or whether the governments will actually turn this tool uh, into a platform of pacifying people, suppressing dissent, and maybe people keeping people happy being in cyber bars or cyber cafes or elsewhere, right? I mean, it's a, I think it's an important question, you know, something I call cyber hedonism, you know, whether the internet would make people, uh, you know, suddenly happy online and, you know, would sort of force them almost to forget uh, you know, the problems of the real world. It may seem like a very uh, science fiction question, but we see more and more of that happening, uh, you know, in, in, in Russia and China and elsewhere. And if we actually go and start applying anthropological frameworks to looking, what do the young people do online? Do they suddenly get all engaged? Only the 1% who do get reported in the Western media get engaged, but 99 who don't get engaged and sit at home and watch, TV and watch whatever YouTube videos, you know, are they getting more active? Are they getting more passive? 
passive, does it make them more likely to go out and suddenly revolt, or it actually sort of contributes to pacifying them a little bit? Uh, so I think those are some of the questions we have to explore uh, and add to some of the questions which John is asking, which I think are fundamentally very good questions. But I think a lot of the things are so intangible, or they differ platform by platform and country by country, that you know, building a bigger model may actually um, you know, mislead us into thinking that we understand it well, well in fact, we don't. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Thanks, Evgeny. Big thank you to all uh, four of our panelists, and thanks to the audience. <laughs>